Very whiny this morning. Yeah, you are. It's because it's the, the morning. What time is it? 9 a.m. Yeah. Oh, my God. So I, I made the bitter mistake of going to bed at like 3 o'clock in the morning, which woke Dean up. And I believe you've been awake since. Yeah, no. 9 a.m. is not better if you get up earlier than 9 a.m. I think that depends. If you get up at 9 a.m., that's awful. If you get up earlier than 9 a.m., then it's even more awful. I'm 3 a.m. worth of it's been awful. Whiny, yeah. Yeah, so whiny. You know, just look. <laughs> I'll try and banish it for the, for the purposes of the podcast. How brave of you. Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a numerical experiment on us and you. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here in the waiting room of the Clinic for the Chronically Online. I'm shuffling a stack of dubious research papers that support my plan to get all my fingers and thumb fused together on each hand to stop me posting. Dean's here as well. He's not actually looking for the clinic, though. Dean broke in and is now perched behind the secretary's desk, having installed Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous on the receptionist's computer. What are you doing back there? You yeah, know, click, click there. You know, your build's horrific. You're going to have to adjust that. There's a guy in the um, the inn who can retrain you. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I've been playing this game for non-stop. Yes. <laughs> it's, time and it's in the days. And I've only owned it for two weeks. Yep. That's a bad sign. It is a bad sign. Mm. But I'm not online. It's not an online game. You don't need to be in this clinic. <laughs> and we have a guest taking notes from behind an array of CCTV screens as part of his research into generative brain poisoning, it's Dr. Tom Bowers. How's it going? Hi, hello. Yes, my name is Tom Bowers. I'm a trainee histopathologist in the UK. I go by any pronouns, but he and him works just fine. Tom is here to lend his professional fury to today's topic, which is medical device failures. Oh. We're going to talk specifically about implanted medical devices, how they're approved, how they fail, and how failure is measured, then we're going to look at a few case studies. Implanted medical devices, not the ones you want to fail. Yes. I would prefer things to be external to me when they fail. Yes. All right. Yep. Noted. Yep. Oh, what time is it for you, for you, there for you, Tom? Sorry for a short digression. It had just gone midnight. Oh, I see. Well, wow. And here I am whining about the time. <laughs> You're up at midnight to talk to Australians about implanted medical device failure. We had, we had two recording options, and the recording options basically were either I record at sort of midnight, or I record at about 6 o'clock in the morning, which is about 30 seconds before my kids usually wake up. <laughs> so... Mm. Unless we needed additional guests. Given the response to intrusions by my cat, I'm sure that would not have been complained about. Mm, indeed, indeed. All right, well, in that case, yeah, I'm going to banish all lingering whining and um, instead make I top don't believe you. By subjecting him to these horrible notes you have here. There's a lot of acronyms here, which usually means something mathematical or something horrible. Oh, well, on this page, there's nothing mathematical. It's all the medical acronyms, which is Tom's thing anyway. Ah, all right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah horrible. So Please yeah, yeah. continue. Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so I have to sort of, I'll try to clarify what any of these are as we go through. Yeah, so, yeah. First off, I'm just going to insert a quick content warning for quite horrific medical procedure details, potentially, and medical complication details, which if you're queasy about that sort of thing, this may not be the episode for you. What if you're one of the hosts of the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I won't lie, Dean. This is one of the reasons I wanted you on. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Every so often we will listen to like a Bunda Vista episode that includes like grotesque medical incidents. Oh no. And Dean will sit there cringing in the car. <laughs> I have to hear one more thing about things being inserted into open wounds. I'm going to I'm going to gag. Anyway, I have bad yeah. news. Yeah, please tell me about all the things <laughs> being inserted into open wounds. Okay. Uh, in terms of my career, so I I was a formerly a trainee in orthopedic and trauma surgery and now I am a pathologist. So I, I, there's pretty much nothing I kind of haven't seen in terms of injuries and surgeries and the like. So mm. even then, this is it's amazing how much this stuff manages to viscerally upset me as to why this things go wrong. I feel like that's a political anger rather than a necessarily like body horror thing though. yeah it, it doesn't really sort of yeah it's quick me out in the sort of sense of sort of looking at it but it does in the sort of sense of just how these things continue <laughs> yes. to come to market and certainly sort of at least every couple of years there's a big scandal mm. spoilers it turns out capitalism was the problem all along yeah no <laughs> 
So first off, we're going to talk about the approval process. Sure. And this is the approval of a medical device. Yeah. So if I have some shiny new device I want to bring to market, Tom, what am I going to do about it? Just to sort of caveat open this up, what we're going to kind of talk about and the way that we're going to discuss this is mostly looking at is with the United States FDA, Federal uh, Drug Administration, uh, uh, sorry, Food and Drug Administration, as the sort of body we're going to look yeah. at, as the archetype. And that's largely because actually they're probably about the strictest. So all, we're, we're going to discuss some stuff that is pretty dreadful in terms of patient outcomes and pretty dreadful in terms of corporate malfeasance in, in terms of how these things came to market and even when there possibly were some known factors that could have led to their failure. And this is still the strictest standard. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the, some of the examples we have were elsewhere, though, so we're going to address that when we come to it. I'm horrified to think that anything American medical is, in fact, the, the most reliable. It's horrible to think that my, my medical system might be less uh, stringent than anything American medicine related. I mean, the, the FDA actually, for the most part, they have much, much stricter standards for a lot of things. Food is like, so for instance, um, for things like food stuffs and stuff, the kind of classic one is um, Kinder Surprise eggs mm, yeah. are restricted in the United States. You cannot bring them into the US. Uh, yeah, because yeah. the FDA says you you can't have a food product that contains a non-edible element inside an edible element. Their food standards are pretty high. Their drug standards are pretty high. Wasn't there a whole thing, though, about what is and is not regulated by the FDA? Because I remember one of my favourite podcasts, which is maintenance phase, I should actually say that, uh, was talking about like FDA doesn't get to regulate things like dietary supplements. Yeah, I think that's the thing. The claims it's making and the things that people make to keep it outside, yeah. just just outside of FDA regulations in mm. certain regards. But anyway, so the FDA has been in existence since the very early 20th century. So the FDA was created in 1906 under Theodore Roosevelt's government. It was set up to regulate food and medicines. It didn't start regulating medical devices, however, until 1976. Oh, that's terrifying. Yes. <laughs> so by this point, they, they, they said they were going to start regulating devices in 1976. Obviously, by that point, you'd had quite a lot of innovations already taking place in terms of medical devices. Mm. So things like pacemakers... Uh, some early models of joint replacements. Uh, these sort of things were already on the market. The leg brace things that Forrest Gump burst out of while he was running along. Those are external, right? This is all devices. So okay, not right, only yeah. those sort of things, but also so this is all medical devices. Hmm. Certain devices were kind of grandfathered in when they did this. So stuff that was already on the market could circumvent a lot of this great the sort of procedures that would be being applied then in future because these products were already on the market mm. but presumably because they had already been on the market we knew that they worked were effective and safe yes <laughs> so yes oh not even oh the, that's a bad sign <laughs> <laughs> the thing is as well is that the, at the time the, the devices that were on the market there were comparatively few of them compared to now yeah i was going to say i feel like there's been a bit of a boom in the past few generations yes but the way they, they broke these devices down was sort of into different classes, and there are three different classes of devices. So class one devices are things like gloves. They're, in terms of the risk they pose to patients, they're, they're very low risk. So there are vanishingly few instances where, where a glove is going to fail mechanically mm. and cause serious injury to someone. Moving on to the next class device, which is class two devices, these are things like sort of monitoring equipment, sort of administration devices. Things that they're not necessarily going to cause direct harm themselves, as a, but there is a, more of a potential for harm to be caused. For instance, you know, if someone leaves a blood pressure cuff on, that can cause you know, injury by cutting off sort mm. of blood supply to a limb. If a device that is designed to monitor, say, blood glucose doesn't read accurately, then that can cause problems. Right. So this is it. Also controls the like precision and accuracy stuff. So as measuring devices. This is basically your diagnostic and monitoring type equipment is usually mostly class two. Yeah. Mm. So it can it can hurt you by failing, but not because it explodes and causes yeah. it to become out. I mean, theoretically, I am sure that there are some cases of like monitoring and diagnostic equipment that does cause harm. 
more like that. Yeah, like, like it catches on fire, but like well, in terms I mean, of look, its... X-rays and that sort of thing, radiation exposure is a hazard. I'm right? guessing that comes under three. If I'm going to guess ahead, Tom. Yeah, so things like that tend to be more of a okay. three. Okay. So, so, so then there is the final plus plus three, which, which is stuff that yes yeah, is involves things like ionizing radiation or stuff that is implanted inside the body. So there are if... two ways in which things can come to market the majority of class one and class two devices come to market via what is called pre-market notification and that is a process by which manufacturer says well i've got a new version of this device it is the term that that will be used frequently from this point is substantially equivalent to an existing device and therefore all we're doing is we are updating it you know in the way that sort of if you imagine you know car manufacturers they release a sort of revised version of a, of a car after a couple of years it's been on the market they'll release a new version of mm. right. whatever device okay. and, and say you know this is effectively the same thing it does the same job none of the ways in which it does that have changed but with possibly some you know cosmetic changes and maybe some other sort of internal changes like we you know we've we've got a more efficient battery or something like mm. that you know that's the kind of thing it's supposed to be used for it's saying well you know we're just updating this device to modernize it a little bit we don't want to have to go through the whole sort of approvals process again if i could just jump in i'm i'm seeing where this is going in two directions here the first is that this is it, if i am i correct in assuming this is similar to the thing where um insulin for example is patented and innovated on by these these tiny little steps without altering the underlying um behavior of the 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 actual art product yeah so there are sort of mechanisms like that for drugs drugs and things as well right right the thing with drugs is that the sort of the way in which there's a lot of messing around with drugs and it's this is kind of probably becomes an episode in itself (laughs) it's more to do with things like patents Mm. right yeah companies are only allowed to produce a medicine under patent for a certain length of time after which point it comes off patent and other manufacturers can make that specific formulation so this is how you get generics right so that's how you get generics yeah right and my second observation would be that could this pre-market notification thing be related to these items that were grandfathered in when this was begun i'm hoping that doesn't there's no connection there yeah there is a little bit <laughs> unfortunately yeah it does because some because it was basically this loophole was effectively created to bring some of these devices in by saying well this is our pacemaker is substantially equivalent to a pacemaker that was developed in 1970 yeah. right. <laughs> and I'm... the pacemaker that was developed in 1970 didn't have to go through this process because it's already yeah, uh, predating the uh, the mm. establishment and it's already in clinical use yeah it's a terrifying concept there can there could be only two links in a chain between like some 1960s snake oil mouse trap that you put inside you and it slaps your heart if it stops <laughs> um, and some corporate board nowadays just deciding how the the mouse trap 3.0 uh, can slap your heart even more exciting ways you and the listener may be able to tell how nervous i am because i'm just imagining all the horrible <laughs> things i'm about to hear and it's real i'm getting pre-squicked <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Don't apologize to him. This is her revenge on me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is the, so what's known as pre-market notification procedure, and it's termed 501k. Uh, and actually the majority of devices come to market via 501k pre-market notification. And that's specifically in the US, yeah? That's This is all specifically in the US. I need yeah, to make right. this, this kind of clear. Other countries, other uh, sort of jurisdictions have very similar Mm. kinds of setups for this and then the other thing we need to talk about is it is then the slightly more strict version of this which is if you've got something that is a completely new device or require a new procedure this has to go through what's called pre-market authorization and that requires some sort of trial or study however contrasting this with what is required to bring a new drug to market a new drug being brought to market and getting FDA approval requires a minimum of two randomized control trials. So I find that interesting. And I have plans to one day down the line do an episode about, shall we say, selective processes and perhaps biased sampling involved in medical trials and that sort of thing. Hmm. But two is not a lot. 
and, and I guess that does depend on sample size and all this sort of thing. But really, it does. They, I mean, there are sort of requirements about sort of they have to be sort of be adequately powered studies. Yeah. And we'll talk about what power of a study is in a second. So I have a question around this, right? Let's say I have a, new, a scalpel that I'm redesigning, right? A scalpel blade specifically. Yeah. Would a scalpel blade be class one or two or three, given it's doing incisions and things? I think I would have to check. A yeah. scalpel blade would probably come under as a class two device. It's not going to be implanted. Yeah, because it does involve, you know, if, if a scalpel blade breaks in you, I imagine it's a bit of a problem. But I imagine, like, if I am just, say, some sort of steel with a new coating or something, that would be a pre-market notification sort of deal. I'm, I'm actually looking at the FDA <laughs> page now. So, in fact, a scalpel is an exempted class one device. Okay, exempted? It is exempted from the pre-market notification requirement. Oh, great. So I can just do whatever I want with regards to scalpel. Scalpels, I think, ex- this, is, this comes into the category of scalpels existed before 1976. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm imagining this tiny katana-shaped yeah. scalpel. <laughs> <laughs> Bespoke scalpels. The scalpels, generally, they are, they're sort of something that's actually quite standardised. Yeah, because, I mean, there's only so many things you can do with that. Yeah, so actually, in fact, there are standard blade profiles, and they have standard attachments as well. And those, yeah. that's a pretty much a word worldwide standard scalpel attachments like a oh, knife yeah. silencer what well, we... so you ha- no in the way so in the way that they fit on to have ah, a handle right. okay okay yeah so you've... it's got a standard fix standard fixation on there for the blade so it's got like a slot there if i say that you know i go into an operating theater in the uk and i ask for a 22 blade i'll get the same blade as if I go to an operating theatre in the United States and ask for a 22 blade. Anywhere around the world, ask for a 22 blade, I will receive the same sort of blade profile. Gotcha. That yeah. makes that is far more sensible, but also less cool than a Picatinny rail on a scalpel. <laughs> so I'm going to continue to imagine it and just rotate it in my mind as you do continue. <laughs> <laughs> See, now I, now I am also imagining in my mind palace, but this time it's somebody doing surgery with a sword. Well, very uh, indelicate. You really do need to watch House of the Dragon. (laughs) I'm good. So in this authorization process, right, there is either notification or authorization. There is some amount of evidence that is presented in order to argue that something should be approved. Yeah. So basically when a manufacturer comes, they say, well, we've got a device and we believe that it is substantially equivalent to something that we already produce or that is already licensed and on the market. So in that circumstance, I've got two questions. For one, what happens if the FDA says, no, you're not getting pre-market notification based on this, or no, you're not getting pre-market authorization? In terms of, if they say you're not getting pre-market notification, it means that they think what you're doing is a new enough procedure, or the device itself is not substantially equivalent to something else on the market, and therefore it requires pre-market authorization. Yeah, so it's basically go away and do your work. Yeah, so you need to come back to them with study data to say that this device that you want to bring to market is performing to an adequate standard in terms of you know whatever you're intending it to do Mm. and in terms of complication rates even though it might not be say substantially equivalent to another device on the market is it sort of meeting equivalent standard in terms of complication rate and such like that to whatever is considered like the gold standard procedure can i just jump in here let's say i have an idea for something that really is quite novel a diesel powered pacemaker (laughs) Uh right we're doing like a 12 stroke pacemaker here this is my fantastic idea now obviously we get a roll call hole in your chest huh yeah let's let's consider potentially that we um foresee this will go badly but it is a pre-market authorization can i just go ahead and try this on people to see if it works like what's the the hurdle to climb before you can just start trialing slash studying on someone I don't know, trying to think my way around this. <laughs> there are things such yeah. as ethics boards, which... Will... Yes. Okay, but let's assume I'm a, is... I'm a medical device company, and thus the only ethics board I have is the 2 by 4 I use to hit people who use the word ethics. So you'd still need to recruit patients into the study, uh-huh. and recruiting patients into the study would require the ethics board approval at the clinical centre that, that you were going to be doing these um, implants at. Right. So in terms of, you you are going to encounter an ethics board at some point. Okay. And if they go, this is a horrendously unsafe device and we can't say that this you know, looking at the way it's constructed, looking at the way it would in, work within a sort of the context of the human body, we wouldn't be able to approve this for Trial. some uh, you know, early yeah. trials or whatever. All right. So what we're saying is ethics boards have gone woke. 
<laughs> the liberal mind yeah. viruses. Yeah, they are. They are woke liberal elite. <laughs> they prevent you rolling coal out of your chest. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. They are stifling innovation. <laughs> All right. So of the data or, or evidence or whatever that goes into this process. How much of that is accessible once something has been approved to either the general public or to the doctors who will be implanting it or using it? The FDA does have to publish the details of its approval processes for each device that they approve. So they, they so every device that is currently on the market does have mm. a actual record and it's assigned a, a sort of a number and there are records as to how this approval process goes. In terms of actually sort of being able to access parts of this process it can be challenging because some some of the development and some of the uh, development process is kind of all internal and that's kept behind things like you know NDAs and yeah um, patents and whatever yeah patents well, and that pa- sort patents of thing. are so, public as far as I know but yeah you patents are public but sort of the actual sort of research and development process and stuff like that that's gone into it yeah it may not be so there'll be some internal data that is just not seen yeah in terms of the actual sort of hearings and stuff these are there do seem to be ways to get hold of this, and and, and just this is just looking at sort of how um, one particular device that we're going to talk about sort of came to market. Is that actually the sort of footage from the approvals process actually did become publicly available, mm. and there didn't seem to be a sort of massive barrier other than sort of financial and obtaining sort of even video footage of that process. But these processes are all sort of documented. Yeah. Uh, certainly in terms of the FDA will say, well, we have approved this device. The testimony received was this. The evidence we had was this. Comments from the board were this. And the final decision is, you know, it's approved or or not, as the case might be. Right. Okay. What does it take for a device to be, like, refused at let's say the pre-market authorization level at that sort of level in terms of refusing devices then it would need to they they need to provide some evidence of this thing working in practice and they would need to be sort of be able to show that compared to like a comparable procedure in terms of both the efficacy of what they're attempting to do with it is you know the same or better Mm. or certainly no you know not Mm. (laughs) no worse within a sort of no worse or sort of no worse within a sort of standard deviation you know yeah uh, and then similarly in terms of complication rate that that's not higher Mm. bearing in mind in the the way that these things tend to be so there's a relatively quick turnaround in terms of development cycles is that actually what we're dealing what is dealing with is is a lot of short-term data yeah well we're going to talk about that in a second way back when we were our very first episode was actually dealing with contraceptives which i encourage people to go back and listen to i've remastered it so it's a bit more listenable they're looking at failure rates of contraceptives, how it's measured, what the research is, and the clinical data is all based on a single year of use, or like Hmm. truncated into a single year of use. If you're somebody who intends to use it for, let's say, your entire life, or 10 years, or 5 years, or something, that may or may not be particularly representative of your actual experience. So I, I imagine you get similar problems potentially with this sort of stuff. Yeah. And and some of the things that we're going to talk about as well is that is in terms of follow up as well is yeah. is that how many if you've got a relatively small sample size to begin with, and in any study you are going to get a certain amount of attrition people to get lost to follow up because people move people think this is working fine oh gosh they've sent me another survey i haven't got time to fill it out i'll do yeah. and you sort of the letter sort of gets filed somewhere and they're never responded to so you do get an attrition rate in terms of follow-up if you're dealing with a small sample size to start with then that has a much bigger impact in terms of the adequacy of the the power of the study yeah and also when things are tested in a sort of preliminary trial environment then the medical industry will tend to favor doing those tests in the sort of quote-unquote healthiest yes individuals that they can so they will try to do it in the most idealized version of patient that they have in mind for uh, receiving this implant or drug or whatever so there is an element of selection bias there as well as i mentioned i want to do a whole episode of that sometime if you're willing to come back and subject dean to more of this sort of material sure <laughs> i'm staring ominously at the little scalpel blade tessa's drawn on my... <laughs> that's that's enough to get my, my hackles rising mm. all right so let's talk about the types of failures in the measurement system so when we have a particular medical device it is trying to do something so that makes for a primary purpose 
which can fail. Like in the case of contraceptives, you can have a, an unintended pregnancy. In the case of like other devices, whatever they are intended to do doesn't work. But that's not the only thing that we can see problems with because you have what's called secondary harms as well. And a secondary harm is something's doing what it's intended to do, but it is causing other things to go wrong in the patient. Like my diesel-powered pacemaker. Yes. Which is exhausting directly into the lungs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that That's kind of the first sort of failure classification system. Is it failing at what it's intended to do, or is it doing unintended stuff alongside? We then care about when does it happen. So the time of the failure. So if it fails immediately, uh, that is both more detectable and potentially more of a problem, depending on the failure type. Uh, if it is long-term, this could be other sorts of failure, like causing cancer or something is not likely to happen immediately, but can be you know, lethal or equally devastating. Mm -hmm. There's also a question of intended lifespan. We tend to break this down into thirds. Any, any classification system, if you can give us a sort of an option of doing things by thirds, then we'll do that. Yeah, so, what, so actually we tend to sort of classify things as sort of yeah, immediate, early or late. Yeah. So immediate is like one might be doing a knee replacement and when you're doing the knee replacement you cut through one of the stabilizing ligaments on the side of the knee. Dean's already cringing, go on. <laughs> this happened to me in the first knee replacement I ever did as a oh, no. surgeon. It kind of gave me a bit of a complex about doing any more of them, but it is something that is a it is a recognized complication and it is something that we managed to fix. Mm. But that's an so immediate complication. Early complication for instance might be that someone has a heart valve implanted then they are sort of doing all right on the sort of first couple of days post-surgery but then they start to develop issues and their sort of blood pressure drops and then they have a scan and it shows that there's, shows that there's bleeding inside the sort of sack around the heart because mm. something's come sort of come loose and they've got some post-operative bleeding they might have to go back to theater to then have that sort of resolved uh, late complication would be sort of with a joint replacement that's gone absolutely fine has done well you know and 10 15 years down the line one component of it has started to uh, to loosen okay so late is towards the end of the intended lifespan or after the intended lifespan generally we're talking months to years so yeah, immediate right, okay. is happening during the procedure itself or just afterwards early within the first sort of few days to a couple of weeks afterwards and then late mm. basically sort of after the patient's been discharged right okay also look at severity and and again we have bias by thirds here yeah yeah mild moderate or severe and we'll talk more about this in a second but basically we we, we have both classification systems in a sense of primary purpose and secondary harm aren't really very ordered i guess I mean, one we might consider more direct to the function of the thing, but they can be kind of equally bad. I'm making air quotes that you can't see here. When does failure happen, you can measure the temporal aspect of that. So you can get a more kind of detailed measurement and contrast that to like intended lifespan or things like that. Severity is a very interesting one, and I want to talk about that as an actual measurement system now. We'll talk about a few other things in a second. So we've talked a bit about severity before in an episode about pregnancy complications. But generally, we have what I would call a partially ordered set. What I mean by that though, is for all of the complications possible, if you pick out any two, you may or may not be able to impose an ordering on them. So you may be able to say one thing is or is not more severe than the other, or that might not be something you can really do because they're just so radically different and on a similar sort of severity. So the three part system of mild, moderate, severe. It's kind of a, well, it's, it's a limited specification there because you have these three classes. They are ordered in the sense that mild is not as bad as moderate is not as bad as severe. But within that, you could have like gradations of severity, even so, if they're not necessarily recognized or particularly useful in this broader classification. So organ explosion is obviously worse than a mild abrasion. Yeah. But we may not necessarily be able to differentiate the severity of organ explosion and organ implosion. They would both just both be in the sort of the severe category. Yes. 
All right, I follow it. Yeah, it doesn't tend to get broken down sort of, I guess, kind of more than that. I suppose you you could possibly enter a third category of sort of, you know, the catastrophic, which is sort of lethal death or mass casualty incident. But that's <laughs> when your diesel powered pacemaker explodes on the train. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and it kills not just its user, but indeed everyone within a, a significant radius. All right, noted. Uh, the nuclear powered pacemaker, on the other hand, <laughs> it's safe. <laughs> Guaranteed thousand year life span. Engraving, this is not a place of honor on the inside of my (laughs) ribcage. One of the things that is interesting about this is like what goes into which classes and how granular that actually is. So, could you give me a couple of examples of mild, moderate, and severe for a Let's pick an item, let's go with that, to make it easier. Okay, because we're going to be talking about them, and it's because it's something I'm familiar with doing as a procedure, let's take a standard total hip replacement. Mm. Mild complications. So this is going to be things like, someone comes back from theatre and they're a bit dehydrated. They're not in shock, they're a bit dehydrated, and they are able to take fluids orally, so you give them some fluids to drink and you monitor what's going on with them. If their vital signs are all okay, you kind of leave it alone. Mm. Someone might have a mild fever, at which point you'd probably give them some paracetamol. Mm. So that's the sort of things that are causing a little bit of discomfort. But this is immediately after the operation. Yeah, this is kind of immediately after the operation. uh, And then let's say, okay, they, you know, get home, everything's healing up fine, but they've got a bit of sort of itchiness around the wound. We're not talking about an infection. We're not talking about anything that's gone on seriously wrong it's just you know they've got sutures or clips in the wound and they're a little bit irritating so mm. it's it's something that either doesn't doesn't need any treatment but it's a little bit a bit annoying or it's something that the level of treatment required for any symptoms is kind of first aid mm. it's something that could be administered it doesn't necessarily need expertise to do that you know yeah. mild pain that can be controlled with over the counter analgesics doesn't require a prescription that mm. kind of thing. So your level of medical intervention here is, you know, bystander first aid kind of thing. You can deal with this situation with things that you have in your house. Yeah. Moderate, let's say this is someone who has come back a week after the operation and some of the stitches we've used to close that wound have come loose. The wound's opened up a little bit. It looks a bit red. Mm. You know, it's not obviously infected but this is a joint replacement so we'll probably be a little bit cautious with that depending on how the sort of wound is looking we'll sort of just say well okay maybe we need to give some antibiotics maybe we need to bring this person in and clean that you know wound up we might need to re-suture it something like that yeah it might be that someone is in quite a lot of pain and needs some intensive physiotherapy and sort of prescription type analgesics so Mm. it's a mild opiate type painkiller that sort of thing that that's not available without a prescription Mm. so in terms of your level of intervention you're at the level of intervention where some degree of medical professional expertise be that Mm. specialist you know nursing a family doctor hospital doctor in the sort of outpatient setting type interventions required here yeah right so severe would be something like you're in the operating room doing the procedure and you fracture the femur right (laughs) Dean has started grimacing already I just my brain just can't help but imagine lots of different pink bits oh I'm such a wuss (laughs) I I see this is why you became vegetarian because you couldn't tolerate handling meat yeah, yeah. I had a um, like a skin thing removed on my back, right? Because uh, it was, you know, potentially dangerous, and um, the wound got badly infected mm. um, and actually refused to close for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks, and so we had to you know, have a course of progressively better antibiotics. Even now, it's this huge gnarly scar. So given that it was open for a significant period of time and infected, would that come under severe or moderate? Did it need you to go back to theatre to have it sort of cleared out and... We went back to the doctor who, like, pushed a whole bunch of pus and blood out of it and cleaned it up a a couple of times. I don't know if that counts as theatre or not. It was in the same room where it was removed. (laughs) To some extent, it's probably still under kind of moderate. Mm. So severe is when there is sort of an immediate risk to life or limb right Mm. you know if that infection is sort of unchecked and then you came back in with say systemic sepsis yeah right that would be severe so if we're talking about infection in this case we're talking about someone has a joint replacement um they get a bit of a wound infection 
they have some antibiotics. You know, they go and see their GP, family doctor. The GP says, yeah, it looks a little bit red. I'll ask the surgeon to sort of see you back in their outpatient clinic, but I'll uh, start you on some antibiotics. Yeah, right. And and this is the, you know, not to say, to sort of single out any particular sort of colleague, but, the, you know, I've seen this sort of happen where someone's seen the GP, the GP's kind of gone, well, I don't want to give, you know, these are very strong antibiotics. I don't want to give too high a dose of these because it's going to yeah, cause right. a lot of side effects in terms of gastrointestinal upset and whatever. So, mm. you know, we'll kind of go for a sort of a moderate dose. You get a sort of partially treated infection and then say a month later, you know, they've said, oh, we'll see you back in outpatient's clinic. By that point, they come back in through sort of A&E or something because they can't walk They've got a fever. Right, so the infection has gone deep enough to be... They've basically got an infected prosthesis and mm. they are clinically septic, something yeah. like that. Clinically septic means what, infection in the blood? So, yeah, so that we're talking sort of septicemia. We're talking a systemic inflammatory response to yeah, right. the infection. So that would need them to go back to theatre, wash out the joint, possibly remove some of the components, mm. that sort of thing. And there is about a 1% risk with what is classed as major surgery, which a joint replacement is, it's classed as major surgery, about a 1% risk for all major surgeries of death during the procedure. So that would come under severe? Severe, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting to hear that because 1% seems pretty high until you think about what's happening like physiologically to the body during the procedure, which is like you just kind of cutting it open, jiggling bits around and things. Don't say it like that. (laughs) Dean had an appendix out last year. Here's the thing. I actually don't mind surgery on me because I'm under anesthesia. If it goes wrong, I don't wake up. I don't have to deal with the consequence. I'm off the hook. (laughs) Admittedly, it's horrible for everyone around me and I do feel for them. But in terms of my experience, Mm. I go to sleep and then I either wake up and it's fine or I don't wake up at all. You know, we're not going to talk about the gradients in between those two. Please. I don't want to be (laughs) disabusing this notion. It's hearing about other people's surgery that makes me squeak like... You mentioning nicking the like one of the stabilizing things on the knee during a knee replacement. I'm sitting here, I've been rubbing my knees <laughs> for the past ten minutes, going, Oh, that'd be awful. What if I imagine that again? <laughs> oh, severe and severe indeed. Okay, so who gets to classify this and is it kind of standardized across procedures? These gets kind of broken down as well by the type of surgical procedures people are having. Yeah, right. And the urgency by which that procedure is happening as well. Mm. So, I mean, this is the, when we're talking about this sort of mortality risk of sort of being, you know, if it's sort of, that's for major surgery, but then there's variances within sort of major surgery, for instance. Mm. The example that comes to my mind is comparing a knee replacement to a heart transplant. You then get to have a, there's things that are called major plus surgery as well. Oh, okay. Man, doctors are not nearly as dramatic as they could be. I guess that's for patient comfort, but like. Hyper surgery was right there. Yeah. <laughs> mathematicians come up with all kinds of fun terminology like annihilators for things in mathematics but i guess we don't have to then talk to patients about that there is a concept in medicine for an annihilator but it's not something that the doctor does <laughs> ask me why the uh, uk has uh, certain uh, restrictions on uh, practice uh <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of uh, doctors and um, and working, because uh, there there is one doctor who very much was that mm. the annihilator. Damn, now that's. I mean, in Australia, we had a guy who got nicknamed Doctor Death. That's true. We did have Doctor Death. Yep. This this is a guy called Harold Chipman, who's actually one of the most notorious serial killers in the UK. The fact that he. Uh, was able to kill so many people was responsible for major changes in terms of regulation. Ah, the wokists got to things, yes. Yes. (laughs) Right, yes. yes. <laughs> These things are improving. If we sort of say it's a 1% sort of risk for major surgery, actually sort of for hip replacement specifically, it's less than that. You know, it's mm. it's sort of at this point in time, we're talking of rates of actually less than 1% down to sort of even a half a percent or lower. Yeah. That has improved over the last sort of 20 or so, 30 or so years. All right, I'm going to haul us forward because, oh my God, we're an hour We're an hour, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> sorry, I told Dave, no, I think it'll be a short one. Sorry, it turned out this was an interesting topic. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you can't blame me for Let's that. get to one of the horrible examples that I'm going to get to make me throw Well, off. first, I actually want to talk about some of the statistics. So first, we're going to talk about the incidence rate. See, Tom, you and I are no longer on the hook for the running time. Now it's the statistician's <laughs> problem. So we could think about this as kind of absolute risk. So you look at all of the things you do and one particular negative outcome, let's say, and then you get some... It's usually given a rate per 100,000 or a rate per 1,000 
or rate per hundred. I mean, if you look at a percentage, that hundred thousand installations. Let's say let's say it's some number in. Let's make that one hundred thousand. So in a hundred thousand people with who have had this done, right, this okay, thing would yeah, occur, yeah, yeah. right? That many times, or that many you expect it to occur that many yeah. times. This raises an interesting question: Do you ever see this? Because if you've only done a thousand of something, right, yeah. you may or may not ever actually observe this happening. And this is a particular problem for clinical trials. And this is where we get to the power of a trial, which is specifically the probability of detecting an effect, let's call it. Right, right. So if I run the clinical trial for a year, but it fails to detect the 367-day explosion. <laughs> yes, Syndrome, okay, noted. If you've got something that is, say, 1 in 100,000, and your trial's on 1,000... Right, you might not ever see it. You might not ever see this in clinical trials, mm. and rare complications are particularly difficult to deal with in any sort of a setting. But if you are rare complications of a device or of a drug... I mean, the sample size has to be pretty large to detect them, and often these are the things that come up later on. Okay, gotcha. Another thing that can influence this is what we think of as, like, bias in sampling. So what Thomas said earlier about how clinical trials typically pick the healthiest people they can to yeah, receive yeah. the procedure, well, that excludes people who are potentially more inclined to have uh, complications and more inclined to have worse complications as well. Going back to our episode on pregnancy risk and things, you can look at the risk of maternal mortality, or let's say gestational parent mortality, across a bunch of different populations. I say, oh gee, systemic racism really exists, huh? Mm. This is true in Australia if you look at the general population compared to Indigenous people, where it's about uh, four or five times higher. This is true in the US if you look at black people compared to the general population. Bias in your sampling affects your observation of incidence rate. Uh, it also affects the sorts of things that you see at all. So when we have our incidence rate, we have some number per population unit uh, for the whole group. But as soon as we start talking about subgroups within a population, we introduce what's called relative risk. So in the case of broad population demographics, you can look at one group in comparison to the whole population. When it comes to things like novel medical devices, often what you are looking for is the new device in comparison to the old one. So what we look at here is, is the risk different? We can look specifically at higher or lower. And what we get is a number called the relative risk. It's usually notated as RR, so I'll use that. This actually brings up an interesting point as well. Yeah. So one of the things that we've sort of mentioned about differences between the approvals process for a new drug versus a new device is that with a drug, you do what's often a double-blind study. So it's either testing the new drug against the placebo or the new drug against the current yeah. gold standard of treatment. And you do that in a way by, by both the recipient of the drug and the person who's administering the drug don't know which they're yeah, giving. doing. With a device... You can't simulate surgery. <laughs> it's very difficult to do... You, can, you Technically, you can do sham surgery. So you couldn't do that for, say, like a, a joint replacement. You can do it for things like, say, arthroscopy. What you can do is... So you want to say, well, okay, does... For someone who's got sort of some possible some early arthritis or a bit of inflammation in their knee joint, if you go in and give it a... A, you know a wash with an arthroscope and tidy up some of some of the inflamed synovial tissue does that have a better outcome than just leaving it alone yeah and what you can do is basically recruit people and do sham surgery so you put a couple of incisions in the knee but you don't put the scope in yeah right but then that's only going to be single blinded yes because the person who's doing it knows whether they've put the scope in or not even then the sort of the ethics of that are Dubious. dubious yeah absolutely because then you're st you know you're still bringing someone into theaters and sort of making a couple of holes in them and then they have sort of things like infective complications or something like that then yeah and they haven't even had the procedure then then you know you you may struggle to get sort of ethical approval for that so mm. what one is often dealing with in terms of devices is dealing with cohort studies so a cohort study is like instead of you do an experimental procedure like well, it is a different kind of experimental procedure, I suppose, but you don't have the kind of control that we usually think of in think people think of experiment. No, you just you just say, okay, we're going to take this device, we're going to implant it to people, we're going to follow up everyone who we put this device in, and we'll you know we'll sort of recruit them into a trial. Say, hey, well, you know, you've been referred to have a, a joint replaced. 
you know, we are currently trialing this new device. This is a device that has passed the relevant manufacturing standards for the jurisdiction it's in but uh, it's a new you know it's a new device and we're given the option you could have this new device or uh you could have the, the standard operation that we offer to everyone yeah so there's an element sort of recruit trying to re- you've got to recruit patients in in the first place the monty hall problem but for your knee replacement <laughs> uh, sorry sir you've got a goat <laughs> we've opened up one of your knee do you want to stick with that or change the other <laughs> Yeah, so so you basically <laughs> you you follow this the, and you can do sort of matched cohorts. So you can say, well, look, these are the trial cohort that are people who are having the device, and then we've got also at our centre we just have a you know a number of other patients who have whatever the standard operation happens mm. to be. You can just say, well, this cohort had this, this cohort had the new procedure, and the relative risk of these complications was. And you can yeah. you can do it in a matched fashion, so you can try to sort of say, well, okay, the groups in these two are representative. But if we're talking about getting a new device onto market as quickly as possible, that takes time. Yeah, you often do not do that. Yeah. No, you just take it. You you say, well, you know, you recruit people in and say, well, we're going to do. The, would you like this new device? And if they say yes, you kind of say, well, this is the things that we've identified as the risks and benefits, etc. Consent oh. procedure. You understand this is a. <laughs> we've had a cat event. <laughs> Hooray! Yay, Owen is here, sitting on my notes. Come here, little buddy. Sorry, please continue, Tom. Cat events are a common occurrence here on the statistically significant... The risk is high. The risk is high, (laughs) cat events. At this point, yes, you've got uh, you you start recruiting patients in and saying, well, look, this is a new device. It is part of a trial. You know, we're seeking approval for it, but at the moment, we are using what's called you know it's off-label use. So off-label is a term for when stuff is being used, but there isn't a specific license for it in that jurisdiction. Black market knees. <laughs> no, those are a different problem entirely. But yeah, and so for sort of medical devices, often there's a lot of in the in the sort of trial process the, the use is also off label the 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 caveat for that is okay you want to use this off label it's got to be as part of a a registered trial for this device yeah and that's where how the sort of the ethics is maintained there so it, yes the use is off label yes it's an experimental device but it is part of a register study that has been authorised by an ethics board as part of, say, you know, the pre-market approvals process. And I assume there would be some offer of, like, follow-up and insurance should something go wrong? Yeah, so that would be the sort of, you know, the ideal standard would be that, you know, you will, it, there is a very sort of standard way of the way these trials are worded, that, you know, you are being recruited into a trial, your data is going to be retained by us. As part of the trial, you will receive this implant, you will receive follow up at these periods and you know we will keep your data for x amount of time it would be anonymized etc i'm gonna wrench us back once more because i yes, want to write this down do, number do down. And, and... okay yeah <laughs> the relative risk as a number is the incidence rate which is that x per hundred thousand or whatever yep in the group you care about divided by the incidence rate oh, for by ev- the whole cohort for everybody else for every- oh everybody else okay yes like you're not just looking at kind of you're not including the group in everybody else because that will slightly change this number and it won't give you the true relative risk if you have a large enough population it doesn't really matter basically there's an asymptotic behavior there dean's law big numbers are weird (laughs) so what it would look like here is let's say it's 1.5 uh per hundred thousand so if we write that divided by 100 thousand over uh, let's say uh, 0.9 over 100,000 the over 100,000 bit cancels out and you just get 1.5 over 0.9 that seems like a fairly substantial relative risk uh god don't make me do arithmetic it's two thirds more it's two fifths more no 0.6 is two thirds of 0.9 I'm not doing this in my fucking head. I don't just, let's just say I'm correct for once. <laughs> no, no, no. Do not, do not pull up the calculator. Do not. Oh. Hang on. You can't cut this either. You have to leave this in. Yeah, 1.6. Yeah, okay. So this would be <laughs> 1.6 repeater, which is uh, 1 and 2 over 3. Hey, I was right. I got something right. Yeah. Tom, Yay. this may be a first. Okay, for one thing, you missed the 1 and... 
So two thirds, this is a bigger number than that. It was never going to be two thirds. Look, I said two thirds, and in the answer, there's a two thirds. That's as close <laughs> to correct as we've gotten so far on statistically insignificant. <laughs> when we get to the gory examples, I'm sitting here in <laughs> in horror, in no, anticipation. No, no, keeping you at this level of anxiety is very handy to me. <laughs> <laughs> so the way that you interpret this is that a relative risk equal to one means no difference. A relative risk greater than one means higher risk, shockingly. And then you could have a discussion about how much higher, right? So if you've got a relative risk of two, you are twice as likely to see it in the group you care about as you are elsewhere. She says, relative Tom, she says risk like less than one. Surprisingly, like, oh, the higher number means higher. As though we don't see examples regularly on this podcast where the higher number means the exact opposite of that. What the numbers mean is entirely arbitrary, and I won't have you condescend to me. In this this is why we do the podcast. That's true. Yeah. Last episode, she said, I'm going to show you these numbers and then revealed a biblically accurate angel. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out they turned into a fractal somehow. I don't... It's bizarre. Anyway, please carry on. A relative risk lower than run one means you have a lower risk in the group you are care about as opposed to everybody else. Yeah. What you get out of a, a trial, let's say, in terms of an estimate of your relative risk is only an estimate. It's only a number based on what you have seen in the trial, based on the samples that you have. And that can make it hard, depending on your sampling procedure, to actually get an accurate idea of what's going on here. Because if you have a relative risk in your study of 1.1, you have to be very careful to work out, does that mean I actually have a different risk in the overall population that I don't see. We have had another cat event. Had a second cat has struck the microphone. He was over there. He's teleported to the other side of the desk. Fun fact, the diesel pacemaker, no <laughs> difference in relative risk. It's compared to what? The incidence events are the same across every demographic group. It's the only not racist <laughs> medical event. Everyone, everyone explodes equally. <laughs> One thing that the relative risk cannot pick up is that if you have something that happens in one thing that doesn't actually happen at all in another. This is basically because if you put a zero on the bottom here, you get infinity. Mm -hmm. If you put a zero on the top here, you get zero. And those are, in some respect, I'm making air quotes here, mathematically the same because you have this centered at one but they look radically different because of the way that using a ratio skews the, the real life. I do not want anything put inside my body to divide by zero. <laughs> Good idea. So basically what happens is that if you don't observe something in one group or another, you have to be very careful about what your estimates actually are. All right, so we've talked a bit about the sources of data for risk. I had that next in the notes, but you did preempt me somewhat, so we're going to skip that bit. The, the one thing to say, and it has been mentioned before, is that Short-term data dominates the approval process. All of the, the clinical studies that are done are typically like maybe a few years follow-up at best, would you say? Yeah, we're talking sort of one to two years. Yeah, which if, you're, if you've got a device that has an expected lifetime of 10 years, that's not even the lifetime of a device. No. And this is something... That's just like leaving a voicemail unanswered. <laughs> if it's important enough, they'll get back to you. <laughs> mm. You're going to hear about it if something goes wrong at the eight-year mark. So We'll get on to sort of what the outcomes of some of these incidents have been as to how you account for that. And in fact, that is the next slide. Oh, no. We're finally at the case studies. Oh, that image bodes <laughs> so poorly for me. <laughs> yes. Take it away, please. So we are going to talk about the first thing is, is a device called the Esure or the Esure. The, the reason that I came on sort of in terms of the answers of the page that Tess sent me this, an article from sort of local news. The ABC, yeah. Regarding this. Now, this is a device. So there's, there's recent uh, local news in Australia about this device. But however, this device has been withdrawn from the market in the United States now for sort of a couple of years. Yeah. It's so it's it's off the market and this is a, a contraceptive device yeah the rationale here is that sort of what the gold standard for contraception oh specifically it's a permanent contraceptive permanent contraceptive device yep yeah. so the gold standard for permanent contraception in women and people with uteruses is tubal ligation surgery 
you've got the fallopian tubes where over meets a sperm cell and then the fertilization happens in the fallopian tubes the blastocyst travels down the fallopian tube and plants within the uterus what tubal ligation obviously does is if you cut the tube then the ova and the sperm don't meet yeah relatively straightforward idea you know and, and obviously this is sort of you know reverse of, of a vasectomy type procedure yeah does the same thing if you stop the tube being a tube then it can't do the thing that the tube is needed for yes i'm um coping with my screaming and sneer by envisioning what we're seeing as a pic is a cross-section of baphomet <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is the bit in the, in the pick of destiny where they cut off his horn. Exactly, exactly. I'm not saying it's, there's a certain um, bovine aspect to the to the image we've been. Are, are you are, are you trying to make analogies? This genuinely, it, there are pagan analogies that kind yes. of go along those lines. Well, I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure that Dean is making the claim that women and people with uteruses are satanic. In so, brackets, positive. Yes. Anyway, please, please continue. I'm just saying this is how I'm coping with um, the thought of in a sort of cool, being... kind of metal way, as opposed to yeah, know, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, QAnon way. Yes. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, tubal ligation surgery is a day case procedure. So, it's what's classic. So, we, we talked about sort of major and major plus surgery. This is kind of minor surgery. It does involve a sort of short general anaesthetic or a regional anaesthetic, a sort of a spinal block. And then often it's done as a laparoscopic procedure, it means making sort of small incisions in the abdomen and around the umbilicus, the belly button, putting a camera in, identifying the tubes, passing a clip across them and then cutting the tubes after having sort of clipped them either side mm. or you know we're going to talk about sort of devices there are some devices that kind of clip around the tube and, cl- and close it off what it involves is clipping and then cutting the tube yeah so it's minimally invasive surgery but it's still invasive surgery and what the SUR device was designed to do instead was to pass a metal coil up through the cervix through the uterus and into the end of the fallopian tube That's this again. at which point the coil is then expanded and sits within the fallopian tube causes a local inflammatory response which blocks the tube yeah so specifically what i read was that it causes over time scarring and local inflammatory inflammation yeah which i gotta say by design by design yes by design yeah, right. so, so as somebody with an inflammation disorder causing arthritis and chronic pain, from the outset, this seems like a real fuck a bad idea to me. The advantage of, of, of this is this can be done in, you know, instead of being minor surgery, this is now the US sort of terms it as being like a doctor's office procedure. Yeah. So they don't really mean that sort of literally in the office, they sort of mean in the sort of, you know, little procedure room kind of thing. But it's an in and out. You can do it as an outpatient appointment. Mm have this thing done akin to so an iud like an iud exactly that's what i was going to so say for reference an iud would typically sit roughly here yeah in the uterus a bit higher up that is what, what were the proposed advantages of this over an iud just efficacy so this is permanent iud's usually last like three to five to ten years yeah so the ones that tend to be used now are a sort of hormone secreting and they last three to five years Gotcha. They're not permanent, but they are sort of long term. Mm. Whereas right. this is for someone who has completed their family or they want permanent ster- sterilization. This is presented as being a sort of more straightforward option that can be done in an outpatient setting. Doesn't require any sort of surgery. So specifically in that context, surgery means cutting things. Yeah. So we t- okay. we're talking about laparoscopic or keyhole surgery. Yeah. But there is a risk that for instance the tubes can't be visualized properly and when doing the consent for the procedure one of the things that that one might say would be well we're going to do this as a procedure with a scope but there is the possibility that we can't visualize things or there is bleeding or scarring or something that we can't access the tube so we may have to convert that to an open procedure right if you do that then obviously there's a bigger scar more potential for complications and things yeah more potential complications because we're talking about this being a more involved procedure for instance Mm. okay and this thankfully meant nothing bad ever happened (laughs) well this avoided the immediate surgical complications like yeah yeah in theory yes in theory first of all it was it had animal trials and it was very successful at animal trials they tested it on rabbits and it was very good at preventing pregnancy in rabbits. Famously, an animal that gets pregnant a lot. 
Yeah, so basically, so the proof of concept worked in an animal model, in a sort of mammalian model. Mm. It sort of worked in terms of what it's supposed to do. And, and we know that scarring up the fallopian tubes causes infertility because that is a complication of things like untreated infection with something like chlamydia, for example, which yes. causes pelvic inflammatory disease, scars the fallopian tubes, and that's why there is a risk of infertility with untreated chlamydia infection. So was this device intended to stay in there permanently or just do enough damage and then be removed? So this was intended to stay there permanently right this came on to the what well, didn't come onto the market this had to get this was a new procedure right so the gold standard yeah. for doing this is tubal ligation surgery something that's done routinely in many centers with a pretty high success rate um we talk we've talked about a little bit about sex rate, success rates of contraception already but you know you're talking you know you're talking 99 plus percent effective procedure for tubal ligation yes and go back and listen to our first episode for more details on what that means to get on to the u.s market this had to undergo pre-market authorization because there was no substantially equivalent device on the market mm. that um, approvals procedure involves you have to do sort of safety testing in terms of the sort of mechanics of this so this is the thing that mechanically sound and also you have to sort of show an animal model and then a human trial yeah again this doesn't have to have two randomized controlled trials and again you wouldn't be able to ethically approve a randomized control trial here in terms of you couldn't test against this against putting in this versus not putting in this yeah because you can't ethically say tell somebody they're on a contraceptive when they're not yeah so you instead have to sort of look at the rates of you you know your outcomes compared to the gold standard the primary outcome here is contraception yes the cohort for this for the pre-market authorization was 682 mm. uh, women in terms of the descriptions that are going to be used in trials and the way that medical language goes medical language is not particularly sort of inclusive no which is kind of, of ironic given identities given how relevant a lot of gender identity is to medical shit yes you know when when the outcomes of these these trials sort of say women they are very binary in the way that they that yeah. they sort of view this kind of thing our sort of societal say sort of, of you know people with uteruses is, is is a group that includes women and non-binary people and you know trans men who have a uterus and fallopian tubes right but in the context of this study this was performed on cis women yes okay when they say women they mean cis women aged 21 to 45 and the primary outcome in this was efficacy of sterilization and they were followed up for at least one year fuck okay but it worked yes yeah so it works this had 99 percent efficacy of sterilization did any of them get pregnant if you've got a 99% efficacy, you saw some unintended pregnancies, yes. Okay. Bearing in mind, we're not necessarily saying pregnancies that were uterine pregnancies went to term, because if, if you have the problem where you've scarred up a fallopian tube, what you can get is still things like ectopic pregnancies. Yeah. But that's a complication that is also seen in tubal ligation surgery as well. Yeah. We're talking at least 99% effective in terms of contraception. Yeah. The second year of data, by the end of year two, they had lost 67% of that cohort. Yeah, right. In terms of beyond two years, they had virtually none of that cohort follow-up for... Now, I unfortunately have not... The paper has eluded me at this point. I think That's with it, right. I think it was something in the region of around 5% yeah that they've been able to retain for sort of follow-up now this device uh went through pre-market uh, authorization and was approved and as part of the approval process what they had to sort of agree to was that they would provide additional long-term follow-up data as it became available so they were they were mandated to have two post-approval studies and then that's sort of to look at both the complication rate in terms of the primary outcome, which is uh, contraception. obviously contraception, and then second and then secondary outcomes. Now, the depending on what studies you look at, tubal ligation surgery has about a one to two percent risk of major complications, and that is things like bleeding, rehospitalization, unintended further surgery, fevers, life threatening events, or death. Mm. The commonest recorded complication is as we talked about conversion to an open procedure from minimally invasive and that is 0.9 percent of cases as per the u.s collaborative review of sterilization mm. so was that 
the rate for this or is that the rate for tubal ligation? Tubal. So okay. that's tubal ligation. So that's the gold standard. Am I skipping ahead by asking what would the rate end up here? It's important we talk about so if there's a few little things in the approvals process that does need to be mentioned as well. Oh, no. You're drawing it out. You're, <laughs> but you're wait, psychopaths. <laughs> you're sadists. All right, please continue. One of the people who was sitting on the obstetrics and gynecology device approvals board was also a board member of the device uh, developer. Ah. So they had worked on this device prior to it being then sold to a major, pharmaceut- a major pharmaceutical and device manufacturer. In terms as well of the construction of the device, the exact metallurgy of it had not been disclosed. Oh, Okay. And the device itself contained nickel. Nickel is a metal that is known to have sensitivity. So, yeah, people who have reactions to sort of certain types of jewelry and stuff, nickel is a, a common cause of that. Some people have like big sort of sensitivity issues with that. So that, in terms of the construction, is something that they hadn't made patients aware of. Uh, what is the, are the symptoms of uh, adverse reaction to nickel? Irritation, inflammation? Irritation, inflammation. What started to happen with the SUR is that people were told, oh, this will be a 20, 30 minute, 45 minute at the out, you know, after most procedure, you'll, you know, go home the same day, you go back to living your life within however many weeks, well, basically this will have had its effect and, you know, you can, you know, it'll be providing effective contraception. Right. Okay. But what instead started to happen was multiple patients reporting bleeding, oh. excessive bleeding. Do I do love, shall, shall we say, being AFAB and having excessive bleeding always be a specifier in these cases? Yeah. And oh, okay. This was, uh, you know, resulting in people then having to sort of go back and then have these things removed. These are designed to be a permanent implant. Right, so that uh, that rate of requiring open surgery has yes gone above zero, which is gone mm. up significantly. What started to happen was these were being widely used, and they were they were very popular, very popular for doctors because you want to do the most minimally invasive thing possible. Mm. Yeah. So you want to be able to do the min- most minimally invasive procedure possible, and patients want something that lets them you know, have the minimum. So even if you don't have minor surgery, you're going to be off work for a few days, possibly a couple of weeks recovering from that surgery. Yeah. If you're talking about something that's an off in an in-office procedure, you can go back out and go on with the rest of your day. Yeah. Then that's something that's very... Beneficial for patients. Yeah. yeah but attractive. The risks that were being reported of these were cramping in 30%, Pain in thirteen percent, oh. nausea and vomiting in eleven percent, bleeding in seven percent, and then way that this eventually ended up being flagged was that one patient set up a Facebook page called S Your Problems. Mm. This patient described their sort of problems uh, that they've been having with this device, and they sort of said to friends and family, "Oh, would you mind sharing this? Uh, you know." join the group and showing this around and if anyone else you know has had this and has had any problems with it join the group mm. you know they did this and they sort of had a few tens of people on there and this rapidly snowballed into hundreds and then thousands of people who'd had this procedure done reporting the various complications we've described above what year was this sorry just this started mid 20 teens ah uh, yes Th- three years ago yeah <laughs> In 2015, delegates from that group went to speak to the FDA, Mm. and the FDA then began officially investigating this device. The product itself... So in 2016, then the the FDA issued a warning about the device, Mm. talk about the complications. It was removed from the market in 2020 in the United States. Is it off the market here? It is now. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, At the risk of my own... Obviously, this the people most affected here are the people with uteruses who had this device and it went awful. But the second most suffering person is me, <laughs> um, having to hear about it. And at the risk of increasing my suffering, what did it actually do internally to cause this cramping, pain, nausea, bleeding and vomiting? This thing is designed to generate a massive inflammatory response. Right. And it was too good. Yeah, it generated a massive inflammatory response. 
<laughs> well, so, so let, let's be clear that like massive inflammation on its face is not necessarily a good thing to have around. Yeah, no, no, I follow. I, yeah. I, I, I won't, when we started talking about it. No, in terms of where this is, is that you get a sort of local tissue reaction way in excess of normal. This causes damage to the to the tissues of the fallopian tubes and the uterus. Don't forget, the uterus was sort of dealing with a structure that is very vascular. Yeah, so yeah. There, are lo- there are a lot of blood vessels in the uterus, and so that's why you sort of get this heavy bleeding and sort of things like that. Um, okay. The cramping and the pain, obviously, from from the fact that you've got chemicals being released. This thing in you causing a shitload of damage as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what's that's what the sort of end result is. Is that is that it was causing huge amounts of problems. But this was something that was not really sort of the, with the short term of the data and the small cohort here. Yeah, means that these effects were not seen to such a great extent in the trial cohort. Mm. But you, I mean, you said some of these were at ten plus percent. 30%. 30%? Yeah. Surely the cohort should have shown some well, of if this. if you're only looking at the first year. Oh, okay, yeah, fair enough. It may not be that bad, if you will. Yeah. And if you have a couple of people with severe reactions in the first year, you basically write those off. I have an instinctive sort of dismissal of the idea of a Facebook group for, hey, I'm having this medical problem. And because I immediately think of like... Um, anti-vax groups. Anti-vax groups or Havana syndrome or something like that. Yeah. I suppose that's why you have to take things seriously enough to do an investigation to actually follow through because evidently people with uteruses were, were suffering. So This caught the attention of um, Erin Brockovich was involved in this. Uh, so obviously a well-known yeah. civil rights campaigner. Yeah. And I think the fact that she was involved involved uh, afforded it a certain degree of clout in terms of you know patient group being the ones to be able to raise this with the uh, uh, you know FDA and get listened to so one of the things we'll see we have two more examples and I'm gonna like push us along a bit we're nearly yeah, the, at two the hours. man's at wake at 2 a.m we could probably get away with the one example the three example matters examples matter because of the bias of uh, triplicate well because of the way that the failures happen okay okay so in in this case we have short-term data we have a device a contraceptive device in people with uteruses primarily tested on women. We have a permanent thing. Yeah. Right? And we have something where these are secondary concern, right? So cramping, pain, nausea, and vomiting, all of this stuff is a secondary harm. It's not a failure of the primary purpose. Right. In this case, what we have is something used in a group of people whose, shall we say, discomfort is frequently disregarded. The short-term data was used in trial. Mm. We have a patient groups are the ones who push for change. This only happened because patients stood up and said, this fucking sucks and it shouldn't suck this much. Yeah, no, I ran into, I don't want to sidetrack us, but I ran into a lot of this when um, my dad was doing cancer treatment. Yeah. You ended up with huge patient groups just saying, this particular chemo hits you like this, you can treat it with this kind of foods. And then you went to speak to a doctor about sort of, you know, how can I mitigate these side effects? And they were quite dismissive that there was any need to, because, you know, the efficacy of the chemo was... Yeah. It's sort of irrelevant compared to your suffering. So you had to go to patient groups to get any kind of sort of solidarity and uh, advice. Mm. Yeah. So some of that is the focus of the medical industry uh, is, shall we say, on overall outcomes, perhaps more than necessarily patient experience. So I think some of that is changing now. Yeah. But also the sorts of things that they look at is what are we willing to accept as risk, as side effects for this outcome to happen? Yeah. And of course, famously, anything to do with the uterus, quite (laughs) dismissed. Yeah. All right. So we're going to hustle on. Okay. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to skip through. Yeah, I, it's probably worth just doing a very quick overview of where how we've got to this point, right? So this is the Charnley low friction arthroplasty. That's a hip replacement, to be clear. Yeah, sorry. And we skipped over what was on the previous slide, which was something called the Austin Moore hemiarthroplasty. So this is that's a very very early type of hip replacement, and you can see it's got a big ball on the end of it, a big metal ball, mm-hmm. which is designed to replicate in terms of sort of size and shape the ball of the ball and socket joint of the femur, the femoral head. This does not include the socket. This is just the ball. This doesn't include the socket. No, this is just the ball. Okay. Do the original ones have a socket or do they just kind of stuff it in the old one? So the Austin Moore, it just replaces the head. That's this. Ah. The, prob- the problem is you've then got a steel ball. Yes. 
articulating with the cartilage and bone socket. Mm. Now, this is something that actually still gets not this specific prosthesis. This is this is a historic device at this point. But these type of prostheses do get used after fractures in patients who are not going to be as mobile. Yeah, right. What we're talking about here is we're talking about an elective joint replacement. So one that is being done for someone who's got arthritis in a hip joint. And the revolutionary design that was developed by Chanley was rather than having a large metal head articulating with the native socket of the hip joint, instead you have a small metal head and the whole thing is for something that could be milled out of a single piece of steel bar articulating with a plastic socket. Mm. You can see on the right hand picture here that you've got the metal of the hip stem and around it you've got some stuff that looks different to the bone and that is what's called cement this bit yeah and it's the same yeah that bit so that's a cemented implant cement something of a misnomer it's more it's actually it's a grout rather than a cement it's not adhesive and it's made of acrylate plastic basically it's a plastic Mm. compound that is squeezed into the shaft of the femur and then the stem is pushed inside and acts as a grout to hold it in place and i'm imagining that this is quite a violent process to be done like if you're putting something in a side of a bone is there, is there banging involved? Are we talking like thumping? How much do you want to know? <laughs> oh, that, that's enough of an answer, sir. So. I'm being genuinely clear that, that, that you, you have to... There are power tools involved? Yeah, yeah. Fair uh, enough. Yeah, you have to remove a certain amount of the bone here. So you have to push the bone out of the way and pull bone out of the centre of the femur. What a nice way of putting it. Yeah. That's fine. Look, I'll let that uh, I'll let that sit where it is. Yeah. Except to note that this particular shape of device looks like something you'd see in a section of historical blades. <laughs> this does look like... Like, like 16th century Kopesh. Found in, <laughs> found in North Africa, yeah. so and so. Anyway, p- please please continue. So this was revolutionary. So you've got a small ball articulating with plastic. What happens with these, unfortunately, over time is they get loosened and it's the cup component that tends to loosen on these. So it's a low friction arthroplasty because the, you've made the, the articulating head smaller than the native joint. Mm. So whereas the larger the head, there's a higher degree of friction. This was sort of the gold standard for a number of years. This was kind of iterated upon to then produce uh, other designs with uh, people sort of learnt about the sort of the, the way that the bone and the metals interface and the sort mm. of the gold standard then became something called the Exeter hip, which is a polished tapered stem. So this you can see has a sort of rough stem and then a, a collar and a cuff. So the stem being the bit that goes into the bone? Right, okay. Right, and then the, you've got the neck and your thing. The advantage of the Exeter was, this is a monoblock. This is all milled out of one piece of steel. The Exeter and variants of it start to induce elements of modularity to them. This is jumping a little bit ahead. So these are then on the top left we're starting to think about what can we do for our younger more active group of patients because they are going to wear out their hip replacements and so what we want to do is we want to have something that is going to remove as little bone as possible and not have loads of plastic cement that we are going to have to remove when we revise it and then also knowing that the bearing surfaces will wear over time material what materials can we make these bearing surfaces out of right and so on the top left this is actually a cementless stem so this is a stem that has you can see it's kind of ridged it's not smooth Mm. it's got some texture to it and what people have discovered over time is that actually you can get bone to integrate with the stem. Ah, oh, okay. That does seem cool. So you don't have to remove as much bone and pack cement around the stem. You can basically make it something that presses into the bone and then the bone will integrate into the advantage being that if that integrates well you might not actually need to remove that when you need to revise it right you might just need to essentially do swap out the head swap out the head and swap out the liner Mm. if everything else is integrated and you see it's sort of slightly pinkish here the head on there is not is not made of metal the head on there is made of ceramic Mm. these are sort of what people were doing in terms of sort of these from the sort of 1980s into the 1990s these cementless stems for younger patients then sort of towards the end of the 1990s they do look more futuristic what sort of surgeons were sort of thinking is well if we want to minimize the amount of bone that we're removing from the femur do we need to remove the whole cut the sort of femoral neck and remove sort of big chunk of bone or could we actually just take away the joint surface and put a metal cap on it Mm. going back to that large head design now that we have much better ma- so the you know we're talking we're talking from the 1950s through then to the you know now the 2000s we're talking 50 years of metallurgy and engineering techniques we can produce a much smoother head yeah, yeah. and a much smoother metal cup and if you have a smooth metal head and a smooth metal cup you can much better replicate the mechanics of the hip joint which works by having a thin film of fluid between the head and the cup so those two don't 
actually rub against each other. Okay, so this is a so there's two on the right and the bottom. So on the top right, this is a hip resurfacing. The first sort of hip resurfacing device that came to market was something called the Birmingham resurfacing prosthesis. Mm. So the Birmingham hip resurfacing, and this was absolutely revolutionary. So this was something that you could offer to younger patients of working age that conserved as much bone stock as possible in the femur. These worked very, very well. And majority of work on these was sort of big centres in England where these were developed. Birmingham, obviously, was where these were developed and tested and were being used to great success. Replace your hip love, Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. You're you see now, I, I feel in response I have to do the rest of the podcast in an accent from my point of view. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh... fair, 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 fair. I mean, that was practically a New Zealand one with some of the vowels, but do go on. That's, yeah, that's the problem. Is it's an, I can localise to sort of the area, but not within a sort of... <laughs> <laughs> not within a few thousand kilometres, yeah. Well, it's not like I sounded anything like someone from Birmingham, so... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you're doing far better than I'm doing there. <laughs> but yeah, so th- we have here a metal-on-metal interface right metal on metal interface yes this device absolutely revolutionary working extremely well so of course when you get a device that comes to market uh, you get other manufacturers who want to develop their own versions of that device so this was owned by um, smith and nephew huge pharmaceutical and uh, medical device manufacturer famously the best thing to do once you have the wheel is to reinvent it yes but of course this thing is protected by several patents yeah right so ah, uh, we'll have to change it the thing that's working we'll have to change it so you yeah have to change it so what a competitor called depew did was they said well we want to have a resurfacing product everyone wants a resurfacing product now we want to have a resurfacing product and we're going to make some changes to the way that the little stem bit implants into the femoral neck and some changes to the depth and sort of degree of coverage in the cup and that is enough in terms of variance to be not breaching any patents and not have and not having to pay any licensing <laughs> to use this design i love capitalism yeah yeah okay their version of a resurfacing device called the asr advanced surfacing replacement again this was being largely developed in the uk we like the brp we don't like the ASR. Yeah, the BHR is a is a good prosthesis that works very well. Right. The ASR is developed by Depew, and this is where you get differences in licensing between different jurisdictions. So in the EU, there are two things that are relevant here. One is that the standard for what is considered a novel procedure is different. This was considered to be a hip replacement procedure mm, right. in the EU. The other thing to bear in mind is that, and so this concept of substantial equivalency comes up, so they are saying, well, look, we've developed this device. It's substantially equivalent in terms of its function to other hip replacement procedures and the other resurfacing product that's on the market. And so the standard which they were required to meet was that this device had to be mechanically safe. Right. If a device is mechanically safe, it doesn't have to undergo human trials. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right yes okay it just has to be shown to be mechanically safe at the time the uk was an eu member state and if a device is proven to be mechanically safe in one eu member country it is to be safe in all eu member countries mm-hmm. so it the, because this device was largely being developed with the assistance of uk surgeons in particular a guy called tony nargle who was working on sort of developing this with Depew and he was responsible for sort of doing the first human implantations of these procedures, of of these Mm -hmm. devices. So they've had mechanical testing. These were actually mechanically tested in the UK and got British safety standard certification so that they could be rolled out across the EU. The key difference here is is that they wanted to market this in the United States. (laughs) Right. The FDA said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not a hip replacement. This is a different procedure. Hip resurfacing is a different procedure. And arguably that's true. Mm. The FDA said this needs to go through pre-market authorization. Mm. So it needed a clinical trial. Of some it kind. needed a clinical trial. They had early data that was starting to come out from the UK. Would that count as clinical data or? That would count as the kind of clinical data that the FDA were wanting. Okay. The problem that they were having was that the equivalent device 
the BHR and of other hip replacements were having about a 1%, what was considered acceptable was a 1% fracture rate year on year. And the ASR was having a 4.5% fracture rate at two Ooh. years. Okay. So the the one percent fracture rate. One percent per year. Okay. And this thing was at four point five for two years. Sorry, four point nine percent by two years. Yeah. Ah. This thing is underperforming, and they take it to the FDA, and the FDA said, "Well, you know, you've got this device, you've got your top surgeon doing this device." Mm-hmm. And even with your top surgeon, they're still reporting this very high... Yeah, fracture rate. Fracture rate. This left Depew in a bit of a bind because while they've got a very sort of... They've still got their European market for this thing, they can't get it into the US market through the pre-market authorization route. What they do have, however, is a already authorized, very successful series of cementless arthroplasty stems on the market. And remember, we talked about these were modular. Yeah, yeah, oh my yeah. god, so they just replace the head in the socket. They are modular to the extent whereby you've got your large metal head, so you can put your large metal head onto your stem d- implant, and at that point, you can go through the 501k procedure right. to demonstrate it is substantially equivalent to the device that you already are marketing. This is just an option. This is a bearing option, because you know you can say, well, we, you know, we offered metal on plastic, we offered ceramic on plastic, we offered ceramic on ceramic, and now we can offer metal on metal. <laughs> Right, so just slap this thing on the existing stem you've already got in someone's femur. Yeah, because that means all the problems are totally going to go away. Yeah. What was causing this this massively heightened fracture rate? I'm actually not sure. Uh, so I'm going to be honest and say I'm not sure what's causing the fracture rate in terms of the... Right. Um, yeah. Here, but you know, this was one very experienced surgeon who was doing the majority of these, one or two very experienced surgeons in the UK, and they were sort of doing these exclusively, having used the BHR for a number of years. Right. They knew how to do a hip resurfacing procedure, and even with them doing this, they were still getting fracture rates. And it's basically the way that these kind of fracture is that you've got this, this short stem capping the femur basically you got an edge around it and they if you imagine the femoral neck's quite delicate yeah 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 so you get a fracture like here across the bone yeah okay ouch it's a femoral neck fracture around the implant and then what you know it's still working as designed to some extent because the neck fractures around this well you cut the neck and you do a total hip replacement right which for your young patient is exactly what you want (laughs) Well, I mean, it's just a complication you can compensate for, let's yeah, say. Yeah. It's a complication you can compensate for, and it's not something that was unknown with the Birmingham either. You will get a certain amount of fractures that occur yeah. around any orthopedic device because... The material, I imagine, is much tougher than the bone. Yeah. The material is the interaction with the bone. But that's not the only thing that went wrong. Oh. Yeah. Oh. What people started to notice, indeed Tony Nagel started to notice, was that his patients who he had implanted with the ASR, and then also by this point they were doing the ASR XL as well, which is the stemmed replacement. You know, this is a device that is intended to last. You know, we're talking about a young patient, working age. It's basically sort of something you put in someone who's 55 to get them to when they retire between 65 and 68, you know, at which point you can put in a total hip. He was seeing patients then who he'd implanted these devices in two years ago, coming back to clinic for their follow-up, reporting severe pain in their hip. Mm. What they found was that the these devices, you know, were, were undergoing mechanical failure. Oh. Remember I talked about they were supposed to, you're supposed to have this, um, form this sort of film and then the metal surfaces don't articulate with each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're looped up. The, the problem is when they start to articulate with each other and what that starts to do is fill the hip joint with metal debris. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so these things are made of cobalt chrome alloy. Mm. And so when these patients were coming back, this metal debris was accumulating in the hip and oh. causing, again, massive amounts of local inflammation. Just freaking Tony Stark to your hip. <laughs> yeah. So to, so Tony Nagel's quoted as saying that, that when the first time he went into revise one of these that the soft tissues and muscles around the hip were destroyed Far out. and there was pus like fluid coming from the capsule he initially thought well this is for whatever reason this is infected because that's the thing that we worry about with joint replacements that's the yeah. one thing we're absolutely paranoid about you do what we always do when we do this we should take fluid off this you take swabs you send it for microbiology and didn't find any trace of any 
spore organisms. Mm. As they found more of these, they tested more of them for infection. And they're going, like, have we got a problem here whereby, for whatever reason, the design, design of this implant is that it's leading to infection for something? And all of the cultures came back negative. And the damage was being done by the actual metal within the joint itself. And so these things formed what sort of were termed pseudo tumors. Oh, great. I've done a revision. I say I've done. I have been present during and assisting a revision of one of these metal on metal hips and you sort of cut into the capsule of the hip joint and black metallic gunk pours forth <laughs> oh. <laughs> i'm thinking of all those like ferrofluid demos with magnetic mm. fields and things oh. so what i'm hearing is that this thing that was deemed mechanically safe was actually a slow motion hand grenade that you've implanted into someone's hip it's just shredded everything in its vicinity yeah oh so it's causing massive Sorry. amounts of local tissue damage. This is a problem because you're the whole idea of this is you're supposed to be able to revise it to a standard hip replacement. Mm. But a standard hip replacement is kind of contingent on having enough bone stock and ligament support around the hip joint to support it. Yeah, a hip to replace. <laughs> well, not so much the hip as the soft tissues around the hip. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can replace the mechanics, but if you don't have the tissues there, it's much less stable, which means it's more prone to other complications like dislocation and things like that which are a real problem and it means you have to do a bigger operation with a bigger revision prosthesis so we've now gone from someone who's having the idealized version is they have a hip resurfacing and then a standard hip replacement and then they don't need any more surgery ever to having a hip resurfacing and then a massive revision prosthesis and revision prostheses do not have the same outcomes in terms of patient mobility and satisfaction yeah that a standard hip replacement does and we are talking about a group of patients who are largely in their fifth and sixth decade yeah they still want to be moving around mm. yeah the other issues that resulted from this were not just the local inflammation and the bone destruction as a result and fractures cobalt and chrome are both heavy metals yeah and not the not the cool kind either no not the cool kind no these are the <laughs> kinds that are associated with cardiotoxicity neurotoxicity with gastrointestinal toxicity so that means problems in the heart and the brain and the gut right problems in the heart and the brain and the gut and and i imagine they stick around and are very hard to get rid of as most heavy metals are a poisonous slow motion hand grenade great yeah yeah, so the, so the, it's not exclusively a problem related to metal on metal hips. This does happen with metal on plastic hips and other implants in, made of cobalt chrome. However, in the metal on metal hips that failed, it's much more accentuated because of the amount of metal debris that they generate. I'm certainly coming to cherish my microplastics more and more as we discuss this. <laughs> I mean, compared to the alternative, yeah. We don't know what the long-term effects of this are. Basically, so patients who have had these devices and have them removed basically are in a situation now whereby they have to have long-term monitoring of their cobalt and chromium levels. And also, in terms of you then, in terms of situation, that a lot of devices on the market are made of cobalt chrome. Yeah. And so if you want to minimize the exposure, you then have to revise them to devices made of different uh, substances, for instance, titanium. Which I imagine are much more expensive. Which are much more expensive and have, you know, again, we're talking about more substantial implants mm. being necessary. Sorry, sorry, I'm just going to summarize this and yeah. push forward because I've got one more to go. This, to me, is, for one, a failure of primary purpose, right? So it stopped being an effective hip replacement as well as secondary harm. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's also something that was picked up by doctors. So it was picked up in, in no small part by the primary guy who was doing them. So this wasn't something where you had to wait for patients to do their own advocacy. Yeah. And the thing that really kind of kicked things off was that he announced he was refusing to do any more. Yeah, I bet. So this is a guy who was their guy who was doing their this Their poster stuff. child, yeah. Well, their poster doctor. Their response initially to this was telling him, well, it's not our implant's fault. You're doing the operation wrong. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that went down real well. Yeah. So they issued a notice saying, well, this is happening because it's of the inclination of the cup and also the size of the head. So this thing was failing more with smaller heads mm. and failing more in, again, women uh, yeah. with a physiologically smaller hip. The other thing as well was we come back to this is that this is a device whereby a lot of the early cohort data was gathered on men mm. with different gait and different inclination in the hips and yeah gait different inclination in hips and a larger femoral head yeah right even though in the early so the french regulator was doing a sort of cohort follow-up on these and they their cohort was about 75 percent men 
25% women and in the women in that cohort they noticed that they were having a much higher failure rate and a much higher Great. complication <laughs> rate. Yes, but the marketing of this device was primarily to women, I imagine. Primarily towards women. Yes. Fuck. Yes. Did anyone I don't want to distract us too much, but did anyone have any repercussions for this? I know nobody went to prison, but was it, did anyone pay any like so there was a class action lawsuit in the US right? and the owners of Depew Johnson Johnson has set aside up to $2.5 billion to settle the cases in the US. Wow. And has that been resolved or is that still ongoing? That is still ongoing. There is still litigation. They are still paying out for this. Did anything happen in the UK? Yeah, so these these all ha- these were recalled in the UK uh, via the medicines yeah. regulatory and, and and healthcare agency we have here. All the patients had to be recalled. They all had to have metal ion checks. They all had to have follow up in terms of imaging. This managed to uh, result in an entire new field of MRI imaging <laughs> that had to be developed for, to to image around these because the metal debris would get in the way. Yeah, right. Well, metal in general gets in the way with an MRI. Yeah, the, the hip joint is too deep down to reliably use a ultrasound you don't get the soft tissue resolution with ct scanners so to get good soft tissue resolution and try and see if you're like how much of the soft tissue damage and and ligamentous damage has been around the hip you've got to develop a new sequence of metal reduction artifact mri sequences to image this which have been successfully deployed elsewhere to image around implants and people who've had spinal surgery to image around Mm. things in the spine and stuff as uh, you know because we can the same metal artifact reduction techniques can be used but they wouldn't have been developed as a result of this but I don't think that's necessarily the trade-off one. With no. <laughs> yeah. I'll hold us back for one more little comment before we move to the next one, which is that on the downside, your hip has been flooded by um, muscle shredding, cobalt and chrome. On the plus side, Immortan Joe will escort you to Valhalla. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to limp. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could ride in the big double truck. Uh, well, I guess. The other outcome from this was that in terms of ongoing regulation, so this this is sort of something that kind of very much brought to prominence the notion of a joint or a device registry. Oh, okay. The UK did have a joint registry, and the in fact the data that was crucial in getting the ASL off the market, they pulled it from the market, you know, pre-publication data that was sort of presented at conferences and international sort of surgeon meetings from the UK, the US and Australia who were doing these devices and reporting problems. The earliest registry was set up in Sweden in 1975. The UK registry was set up in 2002. That was set up following the failure of another device, which coincidentally also involved a large head, Mm. metal-on-metal bearing, called the 3M Capital Head, which did very, very badly and resulted in a registry being established. So this was in 2002, but submission was voluntary. Ah. So the fallout from the ASR was that then the National Joint Registry became mandatory. Yeah. If you put an implant into someone, you have to register that, Mm. specifically an orthopedic implant. Yeah. So in terms of sort of doing joined up sort of thing, although the way they tend to work is you get scandals in one area of medicine and then someone sets up a registry or something like that yeah. that's specific to one area of practice. This became then, in 2011, mandatory Yeah. after this device was withdrawn from the market in 2010. Mm. I'm pretty sure that it caused the start of the Australian registry as well. And that's like a, a common registry of all Yeah, plants? the Australian registry was start again, around the similar time to the UK one. So again, it was more of the fallout from the 3M capital yeah, right. hit that was kicked out of the Australian registry. The US did not have a registry mm. until 2009. Was that related to this or was that other thing? It's not stated as being specifically yeah. related to this implant because at the time there would have been ongoing legal proceedings. Yeah. So naming a specific implant would probably have landed sort of... People in hot water, yeah. 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 So, uh, I, you know, and I am not going to speculate as to... So I'll just say not explicitly related. Not explicitly related, but it certainly probably would have been on the minds of people involved in yeah. approving orthopedic implants. Well, we're actually going to go from the idea of developing these joint rest- registries as a regulation procedure to the good outcomes of having that which is to talk about 
Hmm. This device and the failures of this device. Yeah. So yeah. this is the next gen. So this is a this is a device called the next gen knee. Though this is a a type of knee replacement very commonly used. I have implanted some of these. These you know were in common use when I was still an orthopedic trainee. Apologies, Tom. I'm going to be a little crass here and really bring down the tone of the whole podcast. You thought it was a ballsack. When I first thought this, I thought this was some kind of. <laughs> testicular interface just based on how it's put together please please carry on i'm just i'm so happy to hear this is the knee <laughs> i'm so happy to hear this is to do with the knee <laughs> would it surprise you to learn there are testicular prostheses no because we know a guy who lost one <laughs> yeah, fair enough but for our general audience probably again it's it's one of these things whereby if someone has had testicular cancer and has had a, a radical orchiectomy as for oh. sort of testicular cancer they were often put in a testicular prosthesis uh, for gender affirming surgery is very yeah. easily available for cis men yes absolutely yeah I always get always find it hilarious when Joe Rogan talks about hormone therapy or hormone replacement being abominable when the man isn't is he on, on testosterone he's on testosterone like, purely <laughs> for the affirmation of his own self-image. Yeah. Anyway, all I'm saying is my outcome of this, I'm getting testicular implants, I'm going to have balls as big as apples. Let's continue. <laughs> so this was a commonly done knee replacement and unfortunately the registry data that has been collected over the last few years has shown that this has a much higher relative risk of failure compared to all other total knee arthroplasties in the uk in the particular combinations of this implant mm. how do these two pieces fit together if i might ask these are unlinked so the component that goes on the end of the femur uh, and the component that goes on the top of the tibia in this combination then they're not linked okay so the femur bit is the bit that looks like a ball sack yeah no i follow there yeah yeah okay and they kind of rest against each other they rest against each other yeah right I can see that. And then they have a plastic, you can sort of see uh, there's kind of like a plastic sort of backstop. And that's the plastic that's replicating the cartilage. And you can sort of see between the metal bits kind of at the back here, it's kind of like a backstop which kind of replicates the cruciate ligaments in the knee. This here? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that stops it going too far forward or too far back on each other. But then you rely on the collateral ligaments, the native collateral ligaments to be intact. Yeah, right. If they're not intact, then there are devices that, that are actually linked together. The difficulty with those is they are mechanically a lot more limited in their range mm. and people and they're for knees that are unstable and their outcomes are, are not as good in terms of mobility afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, the, bo the body has a certain amount of, like... Wiggle room. Wiggle room. <laughs> yeah, the knee, is a, the knee is a more complex joint than the hip in a number of ways. Mm. There are a lot of things that are not well understood about it, and the outcomes for knee replacement are not as good as for hip replacement in terms of patient satisfaction. Mm. So with regards to our ideas around, like, medical device failure, this one kind of happened from a, a broad spectrum of kind of population data instead of one mm. person or a handful of people noticing their particular patients were having a problem. Yeah. So in, in that respect, it's a very important demonstration of regulatory success the existence of the registry data was able to identify this problem before it caused, shall I say, widespread, much more noticeable issues in patients. Yeah. While this is a device failure, mm. it's a regulatory success in the sense that the existing regulatory structures were able to intervene before major problems happened. Sorry, I should say, before major problems happened to a whole lot of people. Yeah. yeah. Tom, what did go wrong here? The issue with these is that they develop loosening in the tibial component. Bottom bit, yeah. Yeah, right. so they loosen up much quicker and then as they loosen, they become less stable so people get pain and discomfort, you know, loss of mobility, mm. basically. Mm -hmm. It's relative risk. So this is what they've identified is is that this was a significant, I'm sure you've obviously talked about sort of significance. Yeah, but, so let's call it a threshold of evidence, yeah. Yeah, and then in the worst performing, a relative risk of loosening of 5.41 okay uh, in the sort of best performing 1.85 all right so sorry that's not that's of the devices that were failing that's, okay, the, that's yeah. the sort of there's four combinations okay. of device that were identified as performing worse compared to all other total knee replacements with the worst one okay being and the one 5.41 risk of loosening and 1.85 in the best as it were or least bad yeah yeah, yeah. or least bad yeah yes 
<laughs> so almost twice to more than five times, yeah. And so the outcome of that is that it's basically all the patients who've received this device in the UK have to be contacted, have to be followed up, have to be offered imaging and clinical follow-up in terms of symptoms and this sort of thing. For some of those patients, their knee is going to be fine yeah. and functioning well. The reasons for this are is that, is that there are going to be a number of patients who've had symptoms but may not, may not necessarily think it's a, a result of sort of loosening it. It may just be that, 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 well, you know, my knee's always been a bit uncomfortable since I've had my knee replacement, so I've not noticed anything that's particularly different. Yeah. And then, or some are going to be asymptomatic but have a device that, you know, is going to be loose and, you know, as it loose, continues to loosen, may cause pain but may also cause more serious problems like, you know, fractures. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's just a result of this device being mechanically unsound as well, opposed... it's a specific combination of components that's causing this problem right okay okay i don't yeah yeah this is getting beyond my sort of understanding yeah um, and, it, and to be fair this is kind of getting you know into the weeds of the, the very details of knee arthroplasty which is an area that i have not practiced in for some years it becomes difficult for me to speculate on as to exactly the mechanics of this i wouldn't worry so much about that what i care about with this is the fact that this was detected in population data before it became this huge thing. So and yeah, it, how did that happen? You've got a registry. Yeah, so in the registry... Yeah, so, so since 2011, everyone who has a joint replacement that goes on the registry, and it is very granular data. So it is tracking exactly which components to the level of the different femoral component, right. tibial component, plastic insert... Uh, are they serial numbered or yeah serial okay. serial numbered yeah right so wait were these like modular yeah 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 okay yeah yeah they are so you've got here we've got like three different pieces that you can see the tibia and the femur are both sized to the size of the patient's bone and then the tray is sort of you've got a kind of, you kind of your standard sort of let's say call it a zero size and then you can kind of go up or down from there mm, like right. if you need a bit more to fill a bit more space to keep things stable or things are a bit tight and the range of movement is a bit limited so you just reduce it a little bit sometimes they have that sort of post at the back some of them have it some of them don't mm. depends on the sort of amount of stability some designs of knee replacement retain the collateral ligaments some of them sacrifice the collateral ligaments and put a plastic post there instead yeah right gotcha I mean, that's that's kind of a happy story. A lot of people got a call that they didn't want to hear, but at least they got that before, you know. Their yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, this is, a, this is an example of regulatory success. It's only detectable because the registry is mandatory, because it has a high level of detail. So you have serial numbers, you have batch numbers, you have component details. And with that level of data, you can go in every so often, or you can have an automated process that will alert you that calculates these sort of uh, relative risk statistics. Right. I mean, I don't know if it's set up this way, but you could set it up so that if you have this go above a threshold, right. it will make an alert and then you have to investigate. I don't know if that happened in this particular case, but clearly somebody noticed that there was a higher relative risk and that prompted an investigation. A rare, well, I wouldn't say rare, but certainly to a rare, um, to my visibility, win for... Uh... Uh, large scale medicine, which recently has had some, <laughs> some issues in our well, look, the thing, public sphere. Things are generally improving because it turns out that this works. Yeah, no, I, like... I, doctors generally are getting on with things. It's just you know, public perception of health has just become so um, so fraught. Mm. I'm particularly interested in this because one of the statistics that was quite interest I found very interesting recently was um, that you know satisfaction of gender confirming surgery mm. is higher for that than of knee replacements yeah because of you know people are always yeah. talking about the, the risk it's of... higher for that of hip replacements yeah so it's right, so a knee replacements actually knee replacements are not super well tolerated mm. if you take them because of comparison to hip replacements yeah right so about 90 to 95 percent of people are happy with their hip replacement mm. all right? right and that is very very good right 95 percent of people being happy with a very big operation is in incredible knee replacements are a little bit worse and they're talking we do sort of talking about in the sort of 75 to 85 percent of people being happy with it mm. still good overall but you've got a quite significant number of people who just they just grumble about their knee replacement yeah so the statistics that i saw was specifically for gender affirmation surgery procedures yeah yeah and it had a so this includes like top surgery and bottom surgery and it had like a one percent 
rate of people being un- unsatisfied with the results or wanting revisions of some fi- kind. And that's yeah. fucking incredible, frankly. Well, it's and it certainly puts... You know, so many people talk about this with no basis and now having actually had... Thank you both for talking me through, like, what is the actual numbers and concepts. I always... Fuck, I've learned something again. I <laughs> got him. <laughs> I, could talk, well, I continually well, well. learn things and I hate it. Um, this has let me put sort of a face to that notion of what is it that, about... What, do, what does, what does that number mean? Like, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, consistently, it turns out that giving people um, affirming medical care is good for them. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Who would have thought? Indeed. All right, I am going to stop us there because I have to edit this thing. It's three fucking hours. Oh, I'm so sorry. I am so <laughs> no, sorry. No, it's all right. Do not apologise. It's a heroic effort from you. At, at yeah, I mean, it's what, three o'clock in the morning for you? One day I'll record a, a podcast that is less than two hours and 46 minutes. But, <laughs> well, when, uh, when we drag you back, what we'll do is we'll talk at two times speed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There is a, a documentary on Netflix called The Bleeding Edge, which discusses a lot of the sort of more personal stories associated with these implants and also speaks to some of the people who were responsible for setting up like the SEO Problems Ooh. website, interviews with Dr. Deborah Cohen, who has written extensively in the BMJ about the ASR mm. and how that came to market and ended up being removed from the market. It's kind of the very flashy, uh, nicely edited version of the unhinged rant I can go on, like, sort of uh, <laughs> unprompted about the sort of the state of medical devices and how they end up getting to market. Please, this was a very well structured and researched rant. There are there are more unhinged versions of that mm. rant uh, that that can happen because the, some of this is infuriating. <laughs> we'll ply you with liquor sometime and then put a microphone in front of you. Yeah. It'll be great. For now, though, uh, I say thank you very much, Tom, for coming right. on. Where can people find you? Thank you. So I am on Twitter. You can follow me at FancyWookie on Twitter. I do not have any other um, content that I produce, though I do shop on other shows occasionally. Otherwise, if you happen to be in the UK, please support the junior doctors who are currently taking industrial action uh, against the government, uh, probably soon to be joined by senior doctors and GPs. Also, the... Uh, RCN uh, nurses are reballoting to take industrial action uh, against the government and several other healthcare workers in the country as well. So please support NHS workers who are on strike and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this episode, we have a Patreon. Five Australian dollars a month gets you an extra episode every month. Theoretically, you get access to slides as well, but I keep forgetting to put them up. And it means that we can hopefully in the future at some point pay our guests, such as the very hardworking Tom who doesn't get paid enough as a doctor. Dean, thank you for cringing through the surgical stories. That honestly wasn't too bad. I... I'm not saying what's going on in my brain. I'm just imagining squirting noises. <laughs> and thudding. Thudding. Tom, you <laughs> talked about cutting that ligament and my brain is now playing me a twang noise. It has been for an hour and a half. Incredible stuff. All I right. will let you go. Get some sleep before your kids wake up, man. <laughs> yeah. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye.